originally the company was called Cross Cultures. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you did your homework. You did your homework. Wow. I'm but impressed. then you changed it uh, to Cross Colors. Correct. Right. But you spelled it like the British way. Correct. Like I always thought, because and I guess it worked because I remember when I first saw it, I'm like, oh, this is like a UK company. Right. Because of the spelling. Mm -hmm. And that was the idea. Because of, at the time, the movie Colors. And we didn't want to have that, not, it was a great movie. We loved it, but we didn't want to have a gang association or any kind of negative connotation right. with the brand. So that's, that was the purpose of spelling it the British way. Interesting. Yeah, and our marketing director at the time too, David Stennett, was very <laughs> influential with that as well. Okay. Now, before Cross Colors, you talk about sort of the gang influence that was happening in LA. It was like kind of prison clothes were like the, the urban type clothes, right? The Carhartt jackets and, and that type of thing. Sure, yes. Um, and you guys wanted to get away from that. No. No. We actually um, took a trip to New York because right. that's where the culture was at the time. L.A. didn't really have the hip hop music. It was all coming from, you know, the there was Coast. some in L.A., but you know, it, it really started in New York. Sure. So we jumped on a plane, went to New York, rode the subway. Um, Just sit. Sat on the subway, people. rode through Brooklyn, watched people, watched the kids, watched what they wore on. They're wearing these huge baggy pants that they belted because it was size 38 and the kid was probably a size 30. Mm -hmm. And we said, look at that, look at that kid. And we looked at it and we thought, that's interesting. So TJ, being the artist that he is, as we're, you know, he's sketching, he's drawing. And so what we did, we came back after our, you know, trip to New York, we came back and we said, you know what, we're gonna make that pant but it's gonna be a size 38 body, but it's gonna be a size 32 waist. So that what started it, you know? And we realized that that look came from prison because people that were in prison, maybe, you know, the prison didn't have the right pant right. or and the pant their size and, and therefore- And you can't wear belts in prison. You can't wear a belt and it sagged. So from the oversized pant, well, you know, of course, you have to have the oversized jacket and then you need the oversized shirt to go with the oversized jacket. So all of a sudden, everything is oversized. oversized. And you know, your medium is really a large or an extra large. So everything was sized up, whereas the other brands, the Lorenz, Ralph Lorenz at that time, the Guess, everything was fitted. Yeah. And for the culture, we thought it was too fitted. We need room, you know, we need size. We need that size look. So, and it needs to be crisp and it needs to be solid. Like it had to be heavy. Yeah. So, you know, the next thing we know, we, you know, when we started making and shipping, people from the industry said, you guys changed the industry spec. You know, because everybody else started making larger clothes. And we noticed the, even the NBA, their shorts got longer. Mm -hmm. You know, because all our shorts were below the knee yeah, and right. huge. So the whole spec of the men industry changed. So you guys create these, these uh, designs. Yes. The company is still a small group of people. And you guys go to your first trade show. Yes. And history gets made at that point. Yes. Right. So what happened at that first industry show? <laughs> um, well, basically, when I resigned, I went home and I said, okay, what do we do now? So, obviously, TJ starts to work on the drawings more and um, we collaborate, we meet, we talk, and uh, I show it to a buyer friend at Macy's. Uh, great girl, blue eyes, blonde hair. I said, if she likes it, we're gonna go and open a studio. She's a buyer at Macy's. We showed it to her, what do you think? Now this is after I resigned. I mean, she could have said, that sucks, are you out of your mind? Uh, she said, I love it. 
It's special, it's different, it's great. Would you buy it? Absolutely. So for me, that gave me enough confidence uh, to go downtown, find a studio, set up a pattern room, set up a sample room, hire sewers, hire pattern makers, and get busy making samples. We had three months. Yes, uh, we started in like September, Octo October, I think it was. Yeah, I think the show was in January or February. We had a few months to prepare for the next trade show. Okay. And that was going to make us or break us. And I knew that. We had to go hard. Right. And we had to go, you know, everything had to be perfect. Right. You know? But, but what was important, too, is that we actually, there was so much work put in in those three months. I think, and I'm sitting there now, and I didn't know how much work we were putting in because at the same time as designing the product, we were actually doing the marketing and promotion for the product as well. And that also was something that really helped us, I think, when we got to the show. Because when we got to the show, people already knew about us. They knew about us because of the MTV MTV, and Yo MTV Yo Raps, raps because we, we gave away, because we made, we started making stuff, oh, we don't like that, no, we don't like, remember, we're just, from our gut, right, complete, you know, we weren't following a trend, we weren't looking at runway shows, we, none of that, I mean, there was, there was no social media or anything like that no, anyway, was, I mean, there was magazines, media. but we're just totally from our gut, and, um, um, we, there, we made a lot of stuff that at the end we didn't like. Or we thought, we don't need that. We have this look, it's similar. Mm -hmm. So what are we gonna do with it? David, David find, and, uh, call, call the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Let's see if he likes our stuff. Will Smith. Will, Will Smith. Smith. Let's see if he likes our stuff. David calls, David gets an appointment with the stylist. David goes there, he calls us and say, they love it. Three days later, Will Smith is wearing it on his show. This is before the the magic show. Yeah. So some rap artists showed up, mm -hmm. some other people showed up, here you go, here you go, here you go. Next thing you know, we're into a few rap videos. Videos, dancers. And Do you remember that. who the, the, the rappers were? I don't. I don't. I don't. You don't remember. But, but uh, they were good enough to, you know, uh, MTV was playing their videos. Because, you know, you guys were talking about, you know, the, the West African patterns, which is the kinte, 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 kinte cloth, exactly. Yeah. And hip hop was going through a very Afrocentric time. Mm -hmm. during, it was. During that time. I remember during that era, it was considered whack to wear a rope gold chain. Everyone was wearing like the, the leather African medallions. Right. right. Okay. That, that, that was, uh, yeah, yes. yeah so exactly. Time. Yeah, exactly. So the Nefertiti hit yeah. dress. You guys are, are hitting sort of a trend that was already kind of happening in hip hop. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's interesting how it all is kind of fitting together right around the same time. Right, you know what's really uh, strange about that is that we actually, with the Kente fabric that was actually given to us by Randy Borkin, we actually tried to launch that really strong in the beginning of the collection and the reception was not good from the buyer's standpoint of the product. And I think that's what's so good about the MTV and uh, all the other things that we had that help validate the product without it having to go through the buyers to yeah. be validated. Yeah, you may not like it, but, but the everyone else over here likes it. Taking right. it in, and they're actually, they're, the dancers are wearing it, the uh, actors are wearing it, so they like it. And they're asking for it in the stores already. Dope. So you have to buy it, almost. So how much did you guys sell at that first trade show? Well, I'll never forget that first trade show because I had spent so, I was like sweating bullets. I had spent so much. I mean, we're talking, I spent like $300,000. Went to the show on the To get to the show. You spent 300000 yeah. of your own money. Of my own money, from my pocket. No bank loans, anything. I mean, you know, it's a new business. Banks aren't going to give you money. You know, it's an urban business. It's an ethnic business, whatever you want to call it. It's an African-American business. And so... I didn't bother going to a bank. I, you know, set up the business, put in my money, and went to market. And uh, it was scary, you know. It was really scary. Yeah, it was scary. But, and, you know, we didn't have a great booth location. It was okay. It was okay. Yeah. 
you know, we weren't in the back in the corner, but... But our booth was great. The booth was, was amazing. phenomenal because it was the whole street. We brought the whole street to the show. And the booth was, I'll never forget, corrugated metal, mm -hmm. some graffiti on casters. On it. And we had it on casters. It was very professionally done. I mean, that was expensive to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but very, very nicely it done. And it was, it was done in a smart way where you could flip it out of the case. It was mm -hmm. easy to set up and take down. Portable. And, uh, um, you know, we were the first, probably the, I mean, out of that show of, I don't know, thousands of booths, I can say we were the only African-American company there in the show and the first company to bring streetwear to Magic. And we had no idea. You know, we just, you know, all of a sudden, was that the first day or second day? All these uh, buyers showed up. It was the first day. And we didn't have that many appointments. And, you know, we're in our booth and, you know, some people are, oh, I love it, and they're riding the line, and I look outside, and David goes, Carl, look outside the booth. We're, we're, there must have been 80 buyers standing in line to buy. I mean, it was, the show was, everybody around us was freaking out. They're like, what do they have in there? <laughs> and remember, David had to sort of rearrange the booth. It was yeah, on casters. Was, um, so he rearranged it. So it's almost open. So people couldn't just, because people were just walking in. And we were, you know, sitting there trying to write orders and do business. And people just, you know, the, the, the guys are, you know, nice people, but they're just, what the hell's going on? Why are there, we, you know, we're waiting for buyers and they have 80 people standing in line. And so David rearranged the booth on the caster. So it became, he became a doorman. That wasn't a plan. It's, it was necessity. Because, and he started making appointments. And so he, we were booked for the day. It was a three day show. And we were writing from eight in the morning until seven or eight at night, nonstop. Right. At the end of the show, I had to buy luggage for all the orders. I mean, it was orders by the pound, by the pound. And uh, so I bought this, this luggage because I didn't want to, I took it on a plane with me. I couldn't lose my orders. And uh, we had close to $20 million in three days. So you went from being 300000 in debt. 300000 in debt. Yes. To having $20 million in orders. 20, which, which Overnight. Created, which created more stress because I was so, ex I'm like, wow, I'm so excited. Look, what we, three days, this is incredible. And like, Carl, you, this is phenomenal. I've never seen anything like this. And everybody at the show was coming by saying hello. I mean, people I didn't know, you know, we were, we were cool, we were friendly. And uh, then it came over me on the plane back. <laughs> I need man. $10 million <laughs> to, to ship $20 million. You know, I need $10 million. So I met with... Luckily, I, you know, we had good, a good reputation in town, in the city. So I went to the bank, went to the factor, and uh, they helped me. They helped me make it work. Okay. So you got and a loan to help manufacture this stuff? It was more a line of credits okay. that we got from our bank, from our factor, from our suppliers. We, talk, we met and talked with all the suppliers because there weren't many people in town with 20 million, 15, 20 million dollars in orders. And orders were still coming in right. after, that was at the show. So all the follow-up from the salesman, next thing you know, we're at 30 million dollars, you know? So there wasn't a lot of people in town with 30 million dollars in orders, in real orders, that the bank approved and the factor approved. And if anyone wasn't approved by the bank and factor, they paid check, credit card. I mean, that's the way it worked. And uh, so, suppliers were chasing you know I'm, I'm stressed thinking oh my god I have to go to supplier and ask him for a million dollars in fabric and this supplier is chasing us right I want okay well yeah we will we'll figure this out because you know I could buy a million dollars in fabric there weren't many companies in town except the larger companies such as guess yes and uh, Let's see who else. Would, I mean, there weren't many companies in town buying millions of dollars in denim. You know, we were in the position to compete with guests overnight. So we got respect from the credit industry. We got respect from the suppliers, and 
everybody wanted to do business with us. We, they knew we were honest. They, they knew we were short of cash. To, I mean, you know, we didn't have $10 million to go out and you know, pay for all the supplies, materials, fabrics that we needed. But everybody believed in it, and they believed in us, and a lot of people helped us to get the business going. Right. Gucci's absolutely the boogeyman of hip-hop. Like, it's just certain individuals, you just know that at any given moment, it could go left. Right. Gucci's one of them. T.I.'s one of them. I told y'all that before. I don't know why y'all keep acting like T.I. ain't Gucci level crazy. <laughs> T.I. is Gucci, Gucci level crazy. Gucci might be T.I. level crazy. You, you mean to tell me that if I walked up to your mother right in front of you and shot her in the face, yeah. and then I, I left the country, and you could never, you can't get to me, you Hell wouldn't no. tell the police? Hell no. I'm, I'm a, I'm, where your mama stay at? 